Welcome to Two Guys and Some Horror. Today we're going to talk about one of the most wonderful movies that we've ever seen, In the Tall Grass. It's currently on Netflix. came out in, I believe, October this year. And, Last year. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. And uh, it's, uh, it's a little... I, I, I'll let a review explain it. Uh, moving into it, Curtis, how, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. This week's been much better, much calmer. Much calmer. We're just getting off the uh, New Year's Eve holiday that ended last week, so we're kind of coming in a little fresh. Trying to get back into the work, little... work rhythm. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, me as well, man. Like, we're... This, uh, so How's your car? My car is great. Uh, thank you for asking me. <laughs> I, I, so I'm going to run into, I'm going to do a quick review here. That basically kind of explain this movie, and then we can kind of jump into the synopsis, the way this the show's formatted. We usually do a brief introduction to the film. We kind of do our quick, quick, quick hellos, which we just did, and then I normally do like a quick review. Uh, then Curtis and I get into the synopsis, and then Curtis will usually kind of just go through fun facts and trivia if they don't show up along the way while we're talking, and then we usually go through like some things we've experienced. So thank you for uh, joining us on this uh, this experience. And uh, gonna jump right into it here, Curtis. Are you? Oh, dude, I can't wait. This All is gonna right. be the best part of the episode. All right, so this is a review on IMDb by uh, Lucy Stone ninety ninety one, and Lucy, I think you did a really good job here. This is probably one of the best reviews I've read. The title, the heading says no, just no. I don't write reviews. This one made me. I cannot, in good conscience, allow any coherent individual to suffer through this hot mess. Sometimes you read a review of a movie that is so bad, you want to watch it to see just how bad it is. Please don't with this one. Grass. Yelling. Grass. Screaming. Cal. Becky. Travis. A rock. Darkness. Chanting. There. That's it. You're welcome. Thank you, Lucy. Oh, oh, beautiful, or beautiful. It, or is it more of a snap thing? A snappy, snapping, like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Seriously, best review I've ever heard uh, in my life. It was fantastic. This movie was, I, I kind of watched it. I was like, this is on Netflix. I'm going to watch this. I'm going to go to bed. And I, I was just, it was one of those movies that was just like kind of moving on. Yeah. And as soon as I, I got through 45 minutes of it, I was like, oh, shit. Wow. I want to talk about this. And yeah, so I, Clark texts me. Yes. And he goes, I'm switching my pick. And I go, wait, what? I'm like, I was getting ready to settle down and watch the movie of the week, Naked Lunch. That's what we were initially, originally going to watch for this week. Right. And he goes, no, no, no. I want to switch my pick. And I was like, okay, what? And he goes, I just watched the In the Tall Grass, and we have to talk about it. Yeah. That's it. That's all he said. He didn't give me any. Normally, you give me like, oh my God, this movie's so funny, or oh, it's so, you know, so sad, or whatever, but... And this one you just said, I want to talk about it. And now that that put me on edge a little bit because I had already seen it. I watched it last year when it came out on Netflix back in October. Right. And then um, I was like, okay, I mean, I could watch it again, I guess. Uh, it's been a while since I watched it. I probably wasn't focused. I, I'm pretty sure I watched it while I was at the gym on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. That's how I watched it. Um, so I wasn't really giving it all my focus. But I'm glad you did make me watch it. I, I, I'm glad you did. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's, I think it's good, but it's hard to watch. Okay. Because it's boring. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That's one of the biggest problems I have with anything Stephen King's involved with. Really, you so, didn't like the you didn't like the fog or the was in the, it the in the tall grass the is from 2019. Our director is Vincenzo Natali. Mm -hmm. The writer. It's a is Canadian movie. Vincenzo Natali, Stephen King. And Stephen King's son, Joe Hill. Mm -hmm. This was originally a novella that they adapted into a screenplay. The budget that they got from Netflix for this was $5 million, mm -hmm. which is pretty low nowadays for a full-length film. Mm -hmm. um, and then the body count, I don't know. I just put question marks because do I count all the dead bodies that we see? Do I not? I don't know. With time travel, it's hard. So you don't really need to... The, the, the crux, the weak thing about this movie... The thing that really just makes me not like it is just how long it takes you to kind of 
get into it and get get a taste for it because you're introduced for like two of the main characters mm -hmm. at the, the very beginning and they, they they park at this this church is that the beginning though you know they park off the side of the road he pulls it in well i'm yeah, sorry it's time. <laughs> I'm going to be an asshole go. probably for most of this uh, episode. So, I um, by the way, if you, if you haven't seen this movie, that's it's okay. I don't, I don't know if I recommend it because it is so boring. But the concept is something I think's worth. Hey, 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 hey! Recommend it. If you want to listen to our episode on it, please watch it because it'll be a lot more fun for you to have watched this movie to hear us talk about the movie versus us talk about it because this is a movie that is based on that review a lot more. Like, what are they talking about? Grass yelling grass screaming like it's a great review but doesn't at all explain what the hell is going no, on no 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 and that's that's really at the uh that's kind of what maybe yeah whatever it's worth it's worth just kind of describing because at the very beginning you, you're thinking okay this is going to be a movie where people just get stuck in tall grass and they can't get out and that's what I, that, how i came into it and i was like yeah. there are going to be people and they're dying and it's just going to be something on a watch and then that's 45 minutes of the movie. That's 45 minutes of the movie, and it's just like, I don't want to watch this. This is a pregnant lady. She's she's our heroine. She's she's Sally, does everything right, basically, mm -hmm. and then you have her dopey brother who's just kind of a screw-up. This is where I this is where I lost interest in the movie. Her brother is just annoying. I, he's, I just, I don't do incest. I really don't. And he's not the one who knocked her up, okay? But... Why do you say incest? Because there, it's mentioned, but it's never proven. Beca no, of course it's not proven. But because I know who's the writer of the novella, and I know his work, I know the way that man's mind works. So Stephen King is infamous for having bits of incest thrown throughout his writing, books, and his films. Mm -hmm. So, like, for me, I know for a fact that his intention in writing that Cal was super obsessed with Becky mm -hmm. is that incest level of love. Mm -hmm. Cal loves Becky a little too much. And we know that. You see it in the movie. Yeah. Um, in fact, the moment when... God, we're, we're really skipping around. But when Becky is on her back after she had just given birth and Cal is the one over her, but you don't really know whether it was Cal or whether it was Travis. Mm -hmm. Or uh, not Travis, uh, Ross. Uh, Patrick Wilson's character. Which, which, by the way, I think he did a phenomenal job in this movie. Who was supposed to... He, he stepped in for John Marsden. Mar yes. John Marsden uh, dropped this movie to do uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, which <laughs> I don't know was a good decision on your part there, Mr. Marsden. I feel that you may have made a mistake because I think you would have been a great villain for yes. this movie. Yes, I think he would have done a much um, better job, but I think Patrick Wilson did a good job filling in. Man, dude, I, I don't want to... You can't, I, you can't I, compare that. I right? didn't like him. I didn't like him. I didn't like his character. I felt like... He did a really good job of kind of being like an erratic preacher like character. Yeah. He's like all into Jesus, but the way he acted just kind of frustrated me. Um, so to round it out, back to the mm -hmm. incest thing before I lose that point. Um, my my that's where I started to like really not like the story from these characters' point of view. Yeah. Because Becky is so just missing the point. Cal is she's just lapping up everything that he says. Um, and I feel like, I don't know, I feel like Cal is one of the biggest problems with this whole, like he's one of the antagonists um, in the in the movie. But uh, Nobody agrees with you. He's just, I don't think anybody would disagree with you. Sorry. He, he's, uh, <laughs> nobody agrees with you. Damn, no, no, no. I'm, I didn't mean it that it. way. <laughs> I'm always bad with words. Uh, apologies, no, you're people. You're great with <laughs> words. Let's keep going. Cal DeMuth played uh, by uh, Avery Wooded. He is the brother of uh, Becky Dimuth, who is played by Laisla de Oliveira. And they're both uh, in this wonderful Canadian film. But uh, so they find this boy while they're running, wandering through the tall grass to make a long story short, because this isn't the part that really kind of no. draws you in. This is the first 45 minutes. They find this kid. He's like, my dog's dead. And they find the kid is dead dog. Then they're with each other. And then they find this uh captain cow to the rescue dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. they find uh who, who is uh travis they find travis mm -hmm. and you have a flashback to well flash forward to four months later where they are missing these two are missing and uh he's been looking for them nobody else will yeah. he finds their car 
and he hears them inside the tall grass. If you haven't figured it out by now, Travis, you are the father. So, but Travis, so this that we're now in Travis's perspective, which is where the movie started to actually draw me in. Yes, I agree. Which I yeah. wish they would have done this a bit differently. Uh, maybe start with Travis's story, like from Travis's perspective. No, no, no. I don't even think that would have worked. I would have. Uh, I would cut everything oh, down shit. from the very beginning that okay. needs to be cut down to five minutes this is not this isn't this is not a movie this is this could maybe be an episode if they want to make this into a movie you need to do something different i completely it agree work. i completely agree this is not a movie because when i read in the tall grass the the short story the the novella it reads way better as a story mm-hmm. um i mean the film is almost shot for shot quote for quote from the right. story but the story is still delivered better on paper versus physically having to watch that. And why that is here is because Travis has been in the grass longer than the two main characters, uh, or not the two main characters, uh, Becky and her brother Cal. Yeah, wait, and who is the main character to you? Becky would be the main character. Okay. Um, Becky is the character who we, we follow the most in the movie. And she's the one who she's kind of she's the center she's a, point to me. She's a Mary character, if anything. If you're doing like a religious connection to this, okay. she's she's the mother of, of God because there's like virgin comments and things. Yes, yeah. uh, Ed. I don't know. It's it definitely is a Stephen King. Yep. It it, it has him, him all written all over it. But he, since Travis has been in here longer, he came in here and he's like, I don't know, like the grass is, is controlling us, it's making us, it's moving us, it's teleporting us, it's, it's, it messes with time. I've been here for quite a while. So two days mm-hmm. in the grass is two months outside. That's the equivalent. Okay. Because they say, so, and the reason why I say that, I have a note, because Becky and Cal are like, we've only been in here for two days. They know because the sun has gone down. The sun has come back up twice. Mm-hmm. So they say two days. And Travis is like, no, no, no. You left two months ago. I came to find you. I thought it was four. So it's two months? No, yeah. He says two. Okay. But right. either way, like, so you, there's our algorithm on how many days count as how many days outside, right? Mm-hmm. So inside the grass, one day is one month, which is insane. That's yeah. a lot of time. It, it just doesn't work that way, too, because Travis came in looking for them and they've been gone. Yep. So, this is where the I don't understand a lot of the time travel stuff or how it works in the movie. Right. So if you have any insight or anything like that, please help me and the listeners because I really, like, I'm getting it as much as I think I can get it. There's not a lot. S- Stephen King doesn't give a why. He usually never does. Yeah. He usually gives a this is happening and this we don't. He doesn't really explain it. He, he sometimes he does not in this not in this. Uh, this adaptation. Oh, you skipped the rhyme. What do you mean the rhyme? There once was a guy named McSweeney who spilled some gin on his weenie. Just to be couche, he added vermouth, then slipped his girl a martini. How they're trying to find each other. So, like, oh. Becky's singing the song to Cal. Cal's like, oh, great, you're being, you know, nasty. Um, and then Tobin hears them. So they have Tobin sing it while he's at his dead dog. So they could both get to his voice. Because as they're walking, right, this is the problem with the grass, right? So as you're walking north, you might hear Tobin on, you know, your left. And then you take one step and now he's on your right. Mm -hmm. So as long as he keeps singing the rhyme and they keep walking in his voice's direction, even though it moves or whatnot, they'll always get to him. Because he's never moving. And that's why this is such a, in my opinion, a good movie. It's a good movie, but it's also a bad movie. Yeah. Just because of the pacing alone. If it, if it was paced differently, oh, this would have been so much better. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I had to. Get, I wanted to say that rhyme because I thought it was a really no, funny no, no. Movie. It's great. It's no. I'm glad you 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 said that because you actually mentioned like how they're hearing in the grass and how they're fighting well, each other yeah, a little bit. Which is uh, we we've been jumping all over the place, but that's how the movie works. <laughs> yeah. So it, it time doesn't really exist here. People keep running into each other at different points. Uh, Becky gets a call from herself, and it's like. Don't leave Travis. No matter what happens, don't make the same, or else we're going to keep making the same mistake yep. over and over again. We but have to break the cycle. She's, she can't really hear herself at first. Yeah. Because it's like broken up 
through airwaves. You right? can hear it though. You hear it you just hear fine it. as as the crew member, and she. I think she realizes that she called herself. Yeah. At that point, because this is really. Yeah, this is the this is where they make the change. Right. They break the pattern. And this is where we're introduced to Patrick Wilson's character. Like, right when everyone's together, we're realizing the grass is messing with them, who's kind of the villain of the film. Mm -hmm. And he brings them to the way out, which is the center of the field, which is like a black stone, which has a drawing of two people surrounding a pregnant lady giving birth at the stone. Um, Which there's there's some there's some symbolism here because Becky is pregnant, um, which we didn't mention that. Sorry. But, uh, yeah, they, the guy's like, just touch the rock and you'll know everything you need to know. And then his mom... Yeah, you'll know the way out. You'll know, you'll understand everything. The grass will make sense to you. Cal's the one who's about to touch it, right? And then he... It was so Becky. So I'm confused was at Becky. Which, which time you're talking about. You're talking about when Tobin took Cal to the rock or you're talking about when Travis took everybody to the rock? Because Tobin already touched the rock. Right. And he's take he took Cal there, and when Tobin touches it, he goes, "Boy, that feels good." Like his hair stand up on his arm or whatever, and that's oh, earlier yeah. on. And then everyone gets close. Well, when Patrick Wilson's character is there, yeah, like he tries to get Becky to touch it. Becky yeah. almost does. Yep. But I don't even know if she does. Maybe she did. Mm-mm. But uh, his the wife of uh, no, because yeah, Natalie comes. Yeah. Natalie, the wife of Ross, uh, who's played by Patrick Wilson, uh, which is actually his wife, Rachel Wilson, in real life. Oh, wow. I never knew that. Uh, Wait. Did I know that? That might be in my fun facts and I just forgot. No. Nope, it's not. She, uh, well, what? I think she's she's the wife of him. She like, is. They have the same list. Yeah. Uh, they, she comes out, she's like, don't fucking listen to him. And so everybody's concerned, so they leave the guy. And needless to say, uh, th- he's just this big, creepy monster of a man. And you don't, you can't really gauge what he's going to do. So as a villain, I think really good. But if Mr. Marsden played uh, played uh, Ross, I feel like he would have been a much better. It would better. have been that much better. No, I, I feel like he was perfect for this role. Because imagine James Marsden, you know, he's he's usually playing a charming role. Um, he's, which is what, yeah, which is exactly what Ross has to do here. He he's trying to sweet talk them, and yeah, um, you know, he wants everyone to touch the rock for mm-hmm. whatever reason. What I don't get though is how he is so. The rock has turned him so much, but Tobin is still okay, even though Tobin's touched the rock. But I guess that also. The end of the movie answers that question. I think the after you've touched this rock and it does whatever it does to you, your inner body, like your actual like person, your being, decides your actions after. Because Tobin's totally pure in spirit. He's a child. Okay. With childlike dreams. He loves his dog. Okay. He wants to play in the grass. Whatever. The dad is hell-bent on... When he gets in there, he's got that quote in his head. But Cal touches the rock, too. He does. And Cal... Well, no, Cal doesn't touch the rock. Okay. Travis touches the rock. Okay. Well, Travis touches it later. He touches mm-hmm. it near the end. Cal but never touches it. Before before Travis even gets to that point. Uh, I think the only three people in the movie that we know, that we see touch the rock, um, are Tobin, Ross, and Travis. I have a feeling that... Uh, Ross almost makes Tobin touch the rock. I think he may have, but there's like a bunch of things that don't really fit with this movie. Yeah. I don't... I, I'm glad there's no explanation for it because if there was, it'd be too convoluted and be kind of a pain in the butt to really... to follow. But... So there's a crazy-ass scene at the rock where Ross mm-hmm. is trying to make everyone touch the rock. They get... they just Natalie comes. Then there's a fight that breaks out between Travis and Ross. Right. Where he's trying to protect them and telling them to run away. And then Natalie gets involved, and then he literally takes Natalie's head. Snaps Ross it. does. He he just squeezes it, crushes yeah, her head. Yeah, that hand. was when he compressed her head and oh. it just exploded. Oof! It was a great, I great scene. That very the use gut of budget right there. Good, good budget <laughs> use. But I don't. 
that was during when she's like, don't listen to him, don't listen to him, mm-hmm. and everybody leaves, but everybody at this point is just like terrified of Ross, and they're all running away, he's like, you're gonna be back. They bail, but they, they go bail. to the, they go to the, the store, what is it, a, it's a bowling alley it's a or bowling something, alley, right? but I don't, uh, they're, so it's a real building, um, used in the, you know, in Canada, where they yeah. were filming, that they used for the movie, they basically just used the rooftop, though, they don't really go inside of it, do they? I th- they're very they they're inside a building at some point, but I don't know what they go in and then maybe climb up. Because yeah. this is where we get the big. This is where like if Cal did touch the rock, and I'm, and my assumption is right that your inner being or your 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 intentions on life come out mm-hmm. to the fullest. This would make sense for Cal mm. if he did touch the rock, right? That's where I'm like maybe he did. I don't know, but Ooh. because so Travis slips on the rooftop. As he's falling off, Cal grabs his hand and mm. catches him. And they have this moment where they're looking at each other's eyes. And I think the chanting is going nuts behind Cal. Mm-hmm. And he lets Travis go. And Travis falls off the two-story roof. Flat onto the ground. Bam. And Travis is dead. We think he's dead. Correct. So he drops Travis. So Cal, For the listeners at home. And this is where uh, Becky essentially is like, I don't want to be near Cal at all she no longer trusts him and he's being really weird he's being really goofy which you could definitely perceive that he has he's in love with his sister in a very uh uh, incestual way i think so yeah i I don't know i don't care like honestly i think cal's such an unlikable character that i i don't care but cal meets ross and i'm kind of confused what happens to cal at that point because he shows up in the movie later and mm-hmm. then they kind of do like a twist on you and uh spoilers it's not it's not cal it's ross and he's been feeding this this in this whole creepy oh scene. you're talking about that scene yeah that, that oh, scene you're skipping um, further ahead than i thought yeah, no, 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 no. i'm just saying like we don't really know what happens to cal they don't um so cal's dead so cal and this is what i'm saying you skipped head pretty far so cal if you watch the timeline mm-hmm. of when Cal dies, um, because this is an infinite loop mm-hmm. as well, um, which is, you know, that's basically their answer for anything. If you have a question about time or where people are at or anything like that, it's because they're on an infinite loop. The choices that you make take you down a certain path, it butterfly effects, and then you have an ending. If the ending wasn't to break the cycle, you start over again. And everyone is still in the, the grass, but you start over from where you began. So Cal has these series of decisions that he has to make. Like when he kills or saves Travis. He always chooses to kill Travis by letting him drop off the roof. And then he's being chased by Ross still. Mm-hmm. And that's when Ross makes the, the comment, it doesn't matter what choice you make. I've seen them all already in my head. I know where you end. Whether you went left or you went right, I already know where you're going. And that's why you end up in the same position. And they pan back because Cal's on his back. Ross is on top getting ready to kill him. They pan, you know, they zoom out from the, the scene. And it's Cal's dead body over and over again in different positions from where he ended up. Uh, you know, loop after loop, cycle after cycle. Cal just never... Because the decision, the positive decision for Cal wasn't there. It wasn't getting away from Ross. That's never mm-hmm. going to work. It was not killing Travis in the first place. So, so Cal is killed by uh, by Ross. We just don't see it, or yeah. So you hear it as they're okay. zooming away or whatever. You hear the struggle and the end of Cal's breathing, basically. Okay. So like it's a off scene or off screen kill. And they they do that yeah. because they don't because of the future saying where Cal shows up again, but probably a little bit of that because Becky is so out of it at that moment. Right. So she gives birth at the rock. This is the scene you're talking about, right? Well, no, this scene is... Let's. This deserves its own... Uh... Piece of talking? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like, what? but what? continue going with what you're saying. Well, no, so I was just... That was the end of it. That was... Yeah. Uh, Cal, Cal's dead. So when we get to... Back to the rock, mm-hmm. we're only there with Becky, mm-hmm. Ross, and that's it. Like, in theory, it's just Becky at the rock. And she's the rain's coming down, and she her water just broke. Yep, and which is really funny that they did the water breaking, but it's pouring out. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there was some kind of symbolism they were trying to do there, where I don't know. Anyways, well, it's raining, yeah. and you see blood 
a blood drop splash down on the water, which yeah. is like she's she's about to give birth. And this is not the place to be giving birth. And there's a lot of weird stuff happening. I don't know if she's hallucinating or what. But the rock underneath it, you see like a bunch of babies or like children kind of like clawing towards her. And it's one of the better parts, one of the creepiest parts of the film. Those are all the babies she birthed in the loops, trapped in the dirt. Like that's the only way that you could like, holy fuck, man. That's like the only way that you could explain that. Is that all those times that she's birthed the baby to the rock, the rock never moves. I think it was symbolism. I think so. Oh, man. It's like these are all, this is how many times you've been stuck in this loop. Oh, and she meets the tall grass villagers. The the tall grass villagers. Like they, they all circle her and basically put after her water broke or whatever and, and whatnot. They're pushing her into the, closer to the rock. Um, and their Are you faces... sure this actually happened though? Because I'm not sure if this was a hallucination or not. That's fair. That's fair. I don't know, man. It just freaks me out. Yeah, it was because uh, she wakes up. There's none of that. Yeah. Um. She she's giving birth, and then Cal shows up, and he's like, "Well, Ross shows up as Cal, and he's like, oh, well, she's what? still very let's let's just say it how we see it. So she's still very foggy. She just gave birth. She had just she's given birth. Got hazy. Um. The baby's laying next to her. Yeah. As far as we can tell, she wakes up to water. Yep. Water given to her. Yep. And then she sees Cal. She sees That's Cal. who she sees. And then he's feeding her. And, oh man, I don't even He's wanna... feeding her her placenta, and he's like, yeah. what are you feeding me? He's like, it's seeds from the grass. Yeah. Everything here is grass. Oh man. It's all grass. And uh, you see the, the placenta in his hand, but she's just eating, and there's blood on her mouth. Um, and then it's I, not Cal. It's, it's off-putting... To, to say the least, to see someone eat placenta, but a lot of people do it in the real world. So yeah, yeah. I was like, this doesn't really bother me too much. I don't like it, but whatever. It definitely made me squirm. Yeah, that, and they, they did a good job of that with this film. Yeah, because you hear... Oh, man. You hear her... Like, her, I was watching this... I like to watch it. these movies with my headphones on, because I yeah. really want to feel the sound. Mm-hmm. And when you hear her crunching kind of through chewy meat... Yeah. And the squishing of the bloody juice, it's the placenta. Yeah. And it's it's definitely it's well done. Um, can't argue that. They, but it's not Cal. It's, it's Ross. actually Ross, Tobin's dad. He doesn't kill her though, which no. I don't know why he doesn't. Because but... he wants to keep the cycle going. Well, he wants he does want them out. I I feel like I think he really he's just like you're not ready, and then he just kills them. He's like we're ready for the next cycle, just to kind of hurry it along. I don't think he's really a villain but he comes off as one he's just insane sure that's an option i think at the end of the day the rock needs the babies to survive and live and thrive the rock they feed the babies to the rock that's what's the core of the rock underneath is still the babies the fire the brimstone whatever okay so i think like that's a type of symbolism that these these dead babies or whatever are feeding this rock which is giving power and ross is tapped into that power if he loses the rock and they don't give the baby to the rock, he loses his connection with the rock and his power. Okay, but... I don't know where, if that's, like, legitimately what they're trying to do with it. Right. Um, yeah. Well, Rush... But, well, Travis shows up to save the day. Yes. And he... He blinds our... Ross's eye, he's got one eye that's kind of screwed up. He can't see out of it. Yeah, because Becky stabbed him in the eye earlier, Yeah, right? so she, she does the other eye. Or it's her or Ross, one of the two. So Ross can't see anymore, but he's still beating the shit out of Travis. Yep. And then I think Becky comes up and she does the coup d'etat, her or Tobin. Um, but Tobin shows up, Becky Becky comes, does her last hurrah, they beat the bad guy, he's dead. And Tobin's like, Travis, what are you doing? Because Becky's dead. Yeah, so Travis looks over and sees Becky dead, and then becomes enraged. Right. So he he just walks up puts his hand on the stone and he keeps it there and it shows like this red thing and as a viewer you're like oh no is he is he the new ross right i'm scared but the grass entwine intertwines inside of his body yeah like it wraps all inside of him i thought that was yeah. really cool too that was a good scene and then he says to tobin follow me and he walks him to the edge of the grass mm-hmm. and he places him outside you see tobin outside of the grass and then he's teleported inside the church Yes. And then he runs out of the church, and he's right there to 
stop Becky and Cal from going to the grass. Cal almost just runs right in. Again. The kid saves Cal's life. Cal's Captain a, Cal, to the rescue. Cal's an idiot. And Becky's like, okay, I'm the character who always make who who always has a good feeling about who always has a feeling and then I just I don't feel about going like going in the grass. I think it's bad. Come on, let's go. And they all leave and then they turn around and she makes the decision which which they don't, I don't really explain, but her character point is like she's leaving to give up her baby, but she decides to keep her baby. But because... Tobin, hold on, so Tobin gives her the necklace. Yeah. And then she asks, how'd you get that? And he says, Travis. Travis. Yeah. And that's what really helped her decide, okay, this is a bad idea. Cal, get your ass in the car. Let's not go in there. So. The necklace thing was. This is the happy ending portion of the movie. Yeah. And then it pans into the tall grass. Where you see Travis oh, stuck, so heartbreaking. Still. So my question is: Is Travis, is the Travis from the future still stuck in the tall grass? Does that mean the ta- the Travis from the past is still there? So unfortunately, I think Travis is stuck in the tall grass forever. That's the way it feels to me. I feel like there isn't a happy ending for him, but at least Becky gets to go on and live. The sad part is Cal does too. It doesn't make sense to me because if Cal's, if Travis is gone. In the future, mm-hmm. they're back in the past, so the past Travis is probably still there, still back home. It's probably a different Travis. It'd be nice, right? Well, if you if That's you go a happy to, way to look at it, I don't know. I don't know how to look at it. I don't know how what they don't explain anything. They don't they don't go through anything. My my understanding is like there's probably some sort of a happy ending. Tobin's out. His mom's still stuck in there. So if they wanted to make a sequel for him to find his mom, don't. But they weren't the first ones. To go there. So you're talking about future and past people, right? Mm-hmm. So what about... Because they find Travis mm-hmm. in there. If Travis is stuck in there and not yelling for anybody... In the past. In the, the past. Tobin's out, but the mom and the dad with previous Tobin and dog, where would they be? How does their timeline get affected? See, I almost want to say like all those people are still in the grass in some way, shape, or form. Whoever didn't come out is still in there for sure. So the mom... Ross's dead body is still in there. We know that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, he might have just been sacrificed to the Kumite stone. Maybe. Speaking of Kumites, we should do a fun episode where we talk about blood sport. Blood okay. sport. <laughs> um, so that's the end of In the Tall Grass. That was, it's a really fun movie, um, in my opinion, to get your mind thinking. As you can tell from Clark and I, we're just spitballing ideas here. We're trying to piece everything together and figure out what the hell's going on in that movie because it doesn't just give you the answers. It's not not a bad movie. Not a bad movie. Not a great movie. Not a great not a movie. Bad movie. Not a bad movie. Great acting. I felt everyone did a really great job. I th- I would still I would give that to Tobin. Tobin's probably the best actor in this movie. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, go Tobin. Go Tobin. Team Tobin. So let's jump into our uh, fun facts and trivia. All right. First fun fact. We've already stated it. The film was shot in Canada. Go Canada. Fun fact number two. There is a 1959 Chevrolet customized to look like Christine. From King's original novel with the same name. I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, Tobin's dad was originally supposed to be John Marsden, but he chose to do Sonic the Hedgehog instead. Bad choice, J- uh, James Marsden. Um, trivia number four. This was the year of Stephen King, apparently. We got It Chapter 2, In the Tall Grass, Doctor Sleep, and then not to mention we got Pet Cemetery earlier in the year, along with Castle Rock Season 2. So of these, I would say Doctor Sleep is the only one worth watching. Yeah, is that what I would recommend. I, I'm to pretty, you. I am pretty uh, partial to that film as well. Yeah, it. I would uh, say it is. Uh, it Chapter Two is. I would watch In the Tall Grass over It Chapter Two. Agree. I think It Chapter yeah. One was really good. Agreed. I feel like Chapter Two not as good, um, no. but we'll get there. I will put you through it and make you suffer. Oh man, I. Uh... Um, that's it though. That's all we got. Um, we usually talk about stuff coming up, horror movies that are coming up, but you know nothing's really changed in January. It's pretty oh. much the same from the last episode, dude. dude. Yeah, what's up? Patrick Wilson and Rachel Wilson are not related They're in not, real life. Yeah, I didn't want to bust you on that one. No, no, I'm busting my own <laughs> myth. Busted. If you bust my myths, by the way, uh, do it. Ta- tag us on social media. Do it because sometimes I just say things I think and I'm not sure of. Uh, that- At two guy horror, two guys. Horror pod. Did you know that Christine was in the? Uh, I just said the nineteen fifty. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. You, are you messing with me right now? No, I love Christine. She's she's the best car girlfriend a man could have. 
All right, so there's nothing new coming soon for horror films. But if you want us to do something, if there's a movie you would like us to watch, it doesn't even have to be new. It could be old. It could be obscure. It could be the worst movie you've ever seen. Please add us at Two Guys Horror Pod on Instagram and Twitter. We love to get feedback from you guys on what you want us to watch. Um, and hell, come be a guest with us. Like we'll have you on here. We'll Skype you in. Whatever it whatever it takes. You could be a guest on the show and and give your opinion on a horror film. Um, that you like. Maybe you want to justify why Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is the best TCM out of all of them. Oh, really? Come defend yourself. Those are uh, those are fighting words right there. Come defend yourself. Um, you can also just email us at two guys and some horror at gmail.com if you don't want to tweet at us. Um, we understand. Not everyone uses social media these days. Um, cool. So that's the coming soon section of our of our podcast. Let's move to the what have you watched, read, or experienced lately? Let's let's go. Let's do you first, Travis, and then or Curtis, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into me <laughs> turning into it. an old man. Damn it, I'm Travis. Good work, Travis. I'm stuck in the grass forever. Um. Okay. So this last week I talked about the Tom Savini documentary I watched on Shutter. Yeah. So this week I decided to watch a movie I've never seen before. Um, sh- uh, shut on Shutter. It was Creepshow Two because oh. Savini was in it. So I've seen From Dust Till Dawn a thousand times. I've seen Night of the Living Dead a thousand times, and I've never seen Creepshow Two. So I decided I'd watch that uh, before we did the podcast today, right. and I, I'm not like it wasn't the greatest horror movie I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. It's a really good anthology, mm-hmm. um, and Savini's only in it for like maybe five minutes, so that's kind of disappointing because I watched it for him. But uh, a couple of stories are good. There's three segments in this one. Um, there's the first one, uh, which is basically I'm having a brain fart. Number two is the raft, which I think is the best out of all of them. Number three is about a cheating wife and a hitchhiker. Um, and what was the first one in this segment? Oh, the Chief Big Hawk, the Native American story. Chief um, Big Hawk? Yeah, you'll have to watch it to big, understand. Big Hawk? No, Big Hawk. Um, Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, man. That's, that's Mike a... Hunt would be really offended right big now. Hawk. Mike Big Hawk. <laughs> Mike Hunt would be very offended. Jesus, man. Well, <laughs> now you're making inappropriate jokes. So... Uh, anyways, Creepshow 2, I thought it was really good. Um, like I said, the best segment to me was The Raft. I thought it was a really cool story. Um, it is an 80s film, so take it for what it is. Okay. What, what do you got going on? What have you been doing? I don't know. Dust Till Dawn is one of the uh, the OG horror comedy films, I yeah. would say. Uh, I Quentin Tarantino. I want to talk about a game Robert I've been Rodriguez. playing for, for a long time, now a couple months. It's called Dead by Daylight. You may have heard of it. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's not like we're friends or anything. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, this game, uh, you essentially, you, you can play as a survivor or a killer. And on the survivor side, you want to finish four obje- five objectives to get off this this map where an entity is holding you captive. And this killer, his who's another player, his, his goal is to find and kill every single player in the game. Remove you from the map. Generally hook you for the entity. And you can play from Michael Myers to... Freddy Krueger. Uh, Fred, you can play Freddy Krueger. You favorites. can play the uh, Demogorgon from Stranger Things. Yep. And there are a lot of original cor- uh, monsters that the er, the creators have created, which my favorite is a very controversial one, Legion, who uh, who definitely doesn't take... Uh, a lot of people just don't really like that killer, which I understand. You toxic son of a bitch. He's fun to play as. I'm in. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's fun to play as, but yeah. But He or she... Or she, yeah, you, you actually you, four you taught killers. me that. There's There's four a killers. group of them, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So some of the other you know aspects of that game that are really fun is like you mentioned the different chapters that get involved. So the base game is all custom characters, mm-hmm. but they release chapters just about every quarter or so. Um, some of the cooler ones that they've done is they got licenses to Halloween and, and Jamie Lee Curtis's character from the film. Lori, yeah. Uh, Lori Strode. And they then even you, got cosmetics for them, which got, I was surprised. <laughs> we didn't get shirtless, Michael, but we got pantless. Um, where he's in the, the nightgown. The nightgown from, uh, from the most recent Halloween movie. Well, that and the escape scene. I think it's yeah. a hat tip to both, but you're right. It's in the new one for sure, too. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I love Dead Valley. I'm we, we glad could, you brought that up. We could have a discussion about it sometime if, if anyone's interested. But bonus, like Curtis said earlier today, please check us out. Our Instagram is two the number two horror two two horror two, two horrors guys <laughs> horror pod on both Instagram and Twitter two guys horror pod, and then you can email us at two that is t w o guys and some horror at gmail.com. 
So uh, I'm, I'm gonna go look up two horrors or two <laughs> two horror two horrors guy pod. And I'm here see what to that mess is. up everything. <laughs> that is my purpose. I'm here to botch your life, uh, Clark. Like, I appreciate you. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Thanks for uh, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to us today. I it's. It's a lot of fun for us to make these episodes. Give us a holler. Give us feedback. Let us know if you like our new uh, our new structure to the show. And if you would like to be the, be on the show as well, remember, please do shout out, send us an email or tweet to us. Give us something you want to watch. And we'll have a conversation about it. Hey, and a big shout out to Mimic the Idiot, uh, one of my favorite Twitch streamers out there. Um, he listens to our show religiously, and he's given me... Uh, he already said he really liked Season 2's Episode 1. He said he really likes oh. the new segment... Um, he was just curious. His question was, why did we change the format? So um, just to quickly answer that, time. Time was the biggest thing. Watching two movies and then breaking them apart together in one episode was rough. As you can see, we're able to devote a little bit more time now focused to each movie, which I think gives you, the listener, a little bit better of a journey to go on with us um, when we discuss the movie. So time. We have more time now to devote to the movies and to giving you guys a little bit better content inside the episode. So like Clark said, though, yeah, so, you know, send us some tweets, message us, whatever it is, to let us know if you agree. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Yeah. Do you want to see us on other formats? Would a YouTube channel be something you're interested in? Um, just let us know. And once again, like Clark said, thank you guys so much for listening to us. We really enjoy doing it, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. You're all beautiful. That's not why he <laughs> left him. <laughs> dick was being a dick. No, man. Batman was being a dick. No. Dick was being a dick. How is he being a dick? Dick Grayson didn't respect Bruce.